Right, yeah, so as I said, qualities are not perfect. The, looking at the cost per additional quality gained is also, while interesting, is not a, a perfect way of taking decisions. And so there's quite a lot of interest in asking how can we do it better? And one approach is to use um, qualities, but to recognize that perhaps not all qualities have the same value. And I look at a range of arguments that have been made there. And there's quite a long list here of possible dimensions that might lead to a differential valuation. Reasons why some health benefits might be valued differently from others. And I guess top of the list, although this isn't a really an ordered list, but the first one I've got here is probably the lead candidate, the severity of the condition. And the idea is this, a quality, quality adjusted life here, gained by a patient with a severe condition, uh, by severe condition, perhaps we could say a condition with a very poor prognosis, such a quality might be valued more highly than a quality gained by a patient with a less severe condition. Now, they're both gaining a quality, but maybe we value the gain to one person more highly than another. Now, generally, in most countries, all qualities are being treated pretty much equally. Uh, recently, policy in Norway has changed to explicitly recognize that severity might be important. And so to allow um, for this, and the way they've tried to implement it is by using a higher cost effectiveness threshold when the patient has a particularly poor uh, prognosis. There's also, yeah. Let, let's say we have a Kali between zero and one. Mm -hmm. Does the first principle mean that a Kali from uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 is, should be value bigger than the Kali from 0 0.9 to 1.0? Okay, so, <clears throat> Yeah, the, let's clear one minor confusion or potential confusion first of all. The quality has two dimensions. It has a, a score, uh, that's a QA, the quality adjustment, and it has the life year bit, the survival, the time dimension. So, um, so a quality is um, almost, almost a physical unit. What you're talking about is the quality adjustment part of it. So you're saying, suppose um, a patient is at some level 0.2 and we can move them up to 0.3, should that not be m worth more than another patient being moved from 0.8 to 0.9? Right. Uh, that is one dimension of this, the idea that if somebody's already in quite good health, if they're at 0.8, moving them to 0.9, well, that's good, but it's not very important for them. Whereas somebody in very poor health, let's say 0.2, moving them the same amount up, point, up to 0.3, is much more significant. Well, I'd say the opposite. Ah, good. so if you cut in the, in the 0.8 to 0.9, we've almost got somebody fully healthy, the 0.2 to 0.3, there's still pretty poor health. Yeah, because societally speaking, a person who's at 0.1 to 0.2 yeah. will not be able to work in either case. Yeah. But someone who's at 0.8 will be able to function better and contribute more to the society at, if, it, if, if yeah. he can function at 0.9. Okay, that's interesting. I see your argument. Currently, 
the suggestion is the opposite direction. But um, arguably, um, we could pay much more attention to the so productivity argument. And indeed, we'll maybe not in this one, but we'll come to productivity at some point, I think. Um, is it not more important to some people's health, if you like, is more important than others because of what they do with, with the health? Um, to the extent we have any evidence, there does seem among the general population, there seems to be a, a bit of a preference for giving the benefit to the sicker person. I wouldn't overstate that though, the evidence is a bit mixed. But I, 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 I take your point, I think it's interesting that you're seeing it the other way around. Um, when I come back to um, this bit, which I will return to, and we're talking about waiting just now, including a broader range of consequences, that's been one attempt to actually address the, the sort of productivity aspect and uh, the benefit of getting people back into work, for example, and we'll touch on that. Um, another example is, I can, I can know what you're going to suggest, but proximity to end of life, there's a suggestion that a quality gained by a patient who's uh, near the end of their life might be valued more highly than a quality to somebody who's not near the end of their life. And um, again, the evidence on this is quite mixed. There's been quite a few studies that have attempted to ask, if you like, the public about their preferences here. And I would say about a third of the studies support this idea that perhaps, the older <laughs> interestingly, quite often older people, when if you ask it in an age-based context, older people tend to favor giving benefits to the young, um, which is perhaps slightly against self-interest, but, uh, and then about a third of the studies show nothing, and another third show the reverse. Don't, um, don't give the benefit to people near the end of life. Uh, this is a situation where in England, we actually do have something where we weight some qualities more highly, and it's for a particular patient group, uh, which I'll talk about later, but it's a subset of cancers. And these patients, we are required by the government to weight their benefit more highly. Uh, dread conditions. Some conditions are, are much more highly dreaded than others by society. Is that a reason to therefore value any health benefits that are in those conditions more highly? Another argument is what about rarity? Sometimes we talk about orphan conditions where the number of patients with that particular condition is very small. Should we um, value benefits to these individuals more highly? The argument is a slightly twisted one. It's that because they're such a small patient group, it's going to be quite expensive to do anything for them. Um, the costs of drug development and so on are going to be very high relative to the number of potential patients who might gain. And so there tends to be less investment in these uh, orphan drugs. Again, if you ask the public, you get a range of answers. I find it quite hard to argue in an intellectual way that the rarity of somebody's condition should influence how much we're willing to spend. And the idea we should be willing to spend more of our limited resources on these patients than other patients. You could put it the other way around. Why should somebody with a common condition be treated differently? Why, why is benefit not important to them as important? 
Uh, another one is occupationally induced conditions. Some conditions are nothing to do with um, the choices the, pa the patient has made, but they happen to work in a particular industry and didn't realize that that industry was killing them. Good example of this is um, asbestos and industries that use asbestos. Uh, particularly, of course, for many years now, we've been aware that, uh, of the health problem, but there was a time when we were pretty ignorant about the potential health problems. And so there's a condition called mesothelioma, which you um, develop as a consequence of inhaling asbestos fibres. And uh, indeed, I, I remember a situation, I was on a committee in, uh, in the UK where we approved a drug called Pemetrexed for treating mesothelioma, although it was above the threshold, its cost effectiveness. And the argument was, these individuals were very unfortunate, there were no alternative treatments, and they had got their um, condition through occupational exposure. And they didn't, they didn't know that this was damaging them. So that was thought a reason for um, treating them differently. I won't go through everyone, but uh, we'll just touch on them lightly. What about self-inflicted conditions? Suppose your condition is one that is in effect your responsibility. Should we perhaps value quality gains in self-inflicted conditions less highly? Most obvious example here, um, while lung cancer is not just restricted to smokers, many forms of lung cancer are essentially diseases caused by smoking. Should we value benefits, health benefits to this group of smokers, or maybe ex-smokers, uh, differently? Or um, the other example always is obesity. Now, probably for an audience based in Japan, I probably need pictures to explain what I mean by obesity. Uh, but I guess you're familiar with the concept. Uh, some individuals, of course, um, appear to be grossly overweight, and that has consequences for their health. Uh, is that not their responsibility? Now, most governments have been very reluctant to go very far in this area of self-inflicted conditions. But increasingly in the health service, we do see, for example, surgeons being more restrictive about which patients they'll prioritise for surgery. Now, the argument is not that they're punishing the patient for their bad behaviour in the past. The argument is the um, benefits of surgery perhaps to the obese patient, are um, less than the benefits. And so it's not a case of weighting the qualities, it's just a, it's an argument that the effectiveness of the intervention is different uh, depending on the obesity of the patient. Childhood. Nice in England find it very difficult to say no to things for children. I think many governments find it difficult Should we value qualities for children more highly than qualities for adults? Well, there's arguments for and against. Um, what about health inequalities? What if, if uh, the patients are predominantly in a, a, a low or disadvantaged socioeconomic group? Should we value health benefits that we can give them should we value those more highly? And the, the one I really don't like, but it's called the rule of rescue. Now this is best illustrated when um, the lone yachtsman in the middle of the Pacific is sinking and we spend huge resources to try and find him or her. 
a yachtsman or yachtswoman and rescue them. That's where it comes from. But the idea is this. What about qualies for patients who are in imminent threat of severe health loss? Do we somehow, should we, we must do more for them because if we don't, uh, it's sort of catastrophic. Huge list there. Now, if you started embracing them all, it's not so much your weight in your qualies, your qualies are sort of fragmenting. You'd have a whole series of weights. To date, as I say, um, only Norway and actually Netherlands to a limited extent have brought in legislation that refers to severity of condition. England has this thing with respect to some cancer patients, end of life, what are called end of life, life extending treatments. Otherwise, officially, um, none of these are, um, are really written down too much. Uh, maybe the occupational health one is. There are instances where that is approved of. So, as I said, I need to go a bit faster probably. Um, I'll come back now to this issue. That was waiting qualities. And I want to talk about trying to value a broader range of consequences. So the quality is measuring consequences of a health intervention. It's measuring something to do with change in survival and something to do with the health state the patient survives in. But there are other aspects of benefit that the quality is not capturing. 